Hello, my name is Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, and I'm your host for Sister Power. Sister Power's vision is that women everywhere will learn to live as sisters, to respect each other's differences, to heal each other's wounds, to promote each other's progress, and to benefit from each other's knowledge. Our vision? is to create activities and services designed exclusively to increase women's networking opportunities and to build the knowledge and skills that can lead to self-sufficiency and empowerment. And I am so happy today to have a very, very special guest. And we have Hawaii's first African-American woman judge, the Honorable Sandra Judd Sandra Sims. How are you, Sandra? I'm well. Thank you for having me. This is pretty exciting to it be is? on uh, your first show, Sister Power. And this is really uh, it, uh, quite an event for me as well. Thank you for inviting me to be your first guest. And it's something that you said first. We have a history on first. Yes, we do. And I don't know if you remember that you were my first guest for Sisters Empowering Hawaii, my first special guest at our Women's Empowering uh, Luncheon. And then, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, you were the first guest <laughs> okay. then. Oh and my goodness, does that yeah. show how old we are? What does yeah. that mean? No, that shows about... how young we are. Oh, and okay, we've been okay. doing things. <laughs> we've, been we've been doing things. things. Been doing things. Been doing Keeping things. it moving. Okay, Keeping it yeah. moving. Yeah. <laughs> and for the first annual Women Making History book signing luncheon, you were my first moderator for that, that first annual event. And that was wonderful. So that was very wonderful. wonderful. And now you're the first guest for Sister Power on June 1st. All right. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first Thank of you. all, Sandra, if I may call you Sandra. Of please you may. <laughs> thank you. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in Chicago, and uh, I won't tell you when that was, but you know, you know, I'm retired, but you don't need to know all the year and all that. But I grew up in Chicago. We moved here in uh, 1979, and at the time we moved here, um, I um, I completed law school, so the idea was to begin my legal profession while I was here, uh, since I came here. So. Um, that's, that's, that's where I'm from. That's, I went to uh, Hyde Park High School. Mm -hmm. And I noted something the other week when I was at the um, um, Title IX celebration at the University of Hawaii. Dr. Donna Thompson, who was the first women's athletic director for the University of Hawaii and, 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 and brought all the glory to our volleyball program. Yes. She taught at Hyde Park High School where I went to high school. She left there, as I was kind of young, but she moved here shortly, uh, it, it, it was like in the early 60s, and so uh, I started high school and she had gone, I didn't know that. In our paths, of course, we met and we became friends, so I kind of liked that little bit of a connection. Um, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Went to the University of Illinois and DePaul Law School and, and then here. All right. So how did you go from Chicago to the bench? Well, that's a, that's really, <laughs> that's quite a path, huh? Yeah, that's a <laughs> well, big actually path. actually wasn't, I, I, you know, when we moved here, I, I came here with my um, husband primarily. He works for, uh, at that time he was working for United Airlines and he was transferred here. So we moved here with the idea that, um, you know, it, this would be somewhat temporary and then we'd go back doing whatever we were doing and so forth. But uh, coming here, I was very, very, very fortunate to, um, uh, uh, to get a clerkship with probably one of the finest, kindest people one would ever meet, uh, Justice Hayashi, who um, was at that time head of the um, chief judge for the Intermediate Court of Appeals. I was very, very fortunate to get that position clerking for him, which, um, <clears throat> which taught me an awful lot. It was like my entree into the Hawaii legal scene, Hawaii political scene, and social life and so forth. So I went from there to, uh, I, I didn't start off with the notion that I was going to be a judge. I was just happy to be a lawyer and happy to have a job, like mm -hmm. for most of us. You know? So uh, when I left the uh, clerkship, uh, that's when my youngest daughter was born. But after that, I went to work for the city with the uh, Corporation Counsel's Office. And then uh, from there, I was at the Attorney General's office, and then there were some people that came along and sort of suggested that you might want to consider, you know, doing and applying for a judicial position. I hadn't really given it a lot of thought, but um, I was, 
<laughs> strongly urged <laughs> by mm -hmm. uh, a number of people to, to look into it. So I did. And um, I was very, very fortunate. Uh, Judge, uh, at that time, Chief Justice Lum, uh, Herman Lum, appointed me to the district court, and that was in 1991. And I was on a district court for three years, and then uh, thereafter, uh, Governor Wahe appointed me to the circuit court in 1994. So I was there until 2004. I retired in 2004 because I wasn't really appointed, but that's okay too. Uh, I I retired. I was I had been with the city and with the state uh, for a number of years, and and and. Uh, Truth be told, I was old enough to retire, so <laughs> at that time, so so yeah, I did, and it's uh, yeah, it's quite an experience. But that, it, I didn't start off on this plan of being uh, well, a judge. Well, well, how did you decide that you like to be a judge? At the time that it was being talked about by uh, you know other people who were around me, it seemed like well, that's something I could do. Um, I think I could make a contribution. Mm -hmm. um, there was a concern and also a, a strong push from within the legal community to make certain that our di our um, our bench in in Hawaii is 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 probably one of the most diverse in the country, probably is the most diverse mm. in the country, and was you know keeping with a part of that uh, tradition that we have here in this state. So um, the opportunity came. Uh, I I applied and uh, met the know the requisite requirements and so that's how it came to came to be Wow! What? and then of course you go through the Senate uh, at least for the circuit court I went through the uh, confirmation process uh, with having the Senate confirm that appointment and uh, there that's how I did it. Wow what a blessing yeah what do you Judge Sims consider to be your greatest accomplishment accomplishment on the bench well, I'm retired now, and um, what I think about when I look at the time that uh, I was on the bench, I think what I brought to that to the bench, and I think, and I'm not the only one. I'm sure there are other judges that feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Was that I sincerely made every attempt to treat people with dignity, and with respect, and with compassion. And with those, with that approach to being on the bench, to being a judge, I think that um, I accomplished justice. Mm. Uh, I, and and, and I, I feel very comfortable about having done that. Um, yeah, I do. I'm very comfortable about having really accomplished justice. One of the things that I would always tell my um, clerks and staff is that when people, and, I, and I'm teaching now at, at Chaminade, at the new criminal Ooh. justice program, and it's one of the things I share there as well, is that okay. understanding that, you know, for those of us that work in the field of criminal justice, it's what we do and it's something that we are comfortable with. But when people are brought into our justice system, it is traumatic, and, and it doesn't matter what way they're brought in, if they're defendants, if they're victims, if they're jurors, if they're family members of victims or family members of defendants, when they're walking into that courtroom, mm -hmm. this is not their normal way, <laughs> their normal thing. They are traumatized for the most part. It's intimidating. It's very intimidating. And I said, what I want most is that when people come into this room, that, that you treat them with dignity, you treat them with respect, uh, not just go sit down, go, you know, acknowledge them and and, and have that dignity shown to them. I think it's very important um, that we do that in our justice system. And of course, as dealing with cases, of course, mm -hmm. then clearly, clearly, the uh, administering of justice is important. So I, I, I'm, 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 I'm fairly comfortable that that's what I brought um, to the bench. And I'm, I'm comfortable with the time that I was there and the time that I've been away. Well, that's commendable. Yeah. Um, that's um, something that people coming in and out of the courtroom want that feeling of ease when you walk in, no matter what yeah. type of case yeah, it is. because it's not an easy place to no, be. No, it's not. <laughs> Especially criminal court. It's not an easy place sure. to be for anybody. Mm -hmm. So, yeah.
So I know that. I just got a summons for jury duty, too. I'm real excited. <laughs> you know, you are? Because, you know, when we first met. I've never been on a jury. jury I'd like so to be long. on a jury. Well, that's in your book. You well, talk I, about I, I, I you talk, talk about, about what that. I, you know, what it was, what it was like. Well, I talk about my work with jury. Sure. It's one of the things I really uh, enjoyed was uh, being able to take time after a case and sit down and talk with the jurors about the case. And I could, you know, sort of tell them. You know what we were, what you know. Thank them, of course, for what they did, but sort of make the process not so scary for them. I didn't just say thank you and go home, but we sat and chatted, and they asked questions. I tried to answer as many questions as I could, you know, as long as I could give them a, a proper answer. But they always wanted to know if they made the right decision. Yeah. And I always told them, you know, whatever decision that you make is the correct decision, because if you're making your decision on the law and the evidence, then that's the correct decision. So even if it's a mistrial, you made the right decision. And that you can sleep at night with that. I, you, that that's it. I said, whatever you, if you, if you followed the law and if you assess the credibility of the witnesses and, and you followed my instructions, of course, the judge's instructions, <laughs> right. follow my instructions and <laughs> apply the law, then the decision that you come to, the, all 12 of you, because that's the thing, the, cre you know, the critical thing in, in, in criminal cases, if you can get 12 people from all kinds of backgrounds, diverse experiences, ages, and so forth, to come to a single, the same decision, that's justice. There you go. Justice. Plain and simple. All right. Well, well not quite plain that, and simple. But yeah, that's kind of But what you're happened. making it sound yeah. plain and simple. Yeah. Well, living here in Hawaii, there's approximately uh, 8,000 uh, lawyers here on the island, approximately. Really? Is that many now? Yeah, it's that many now. And, <laughs> you know, living in Los Angeles, we should say you need a lawyer for your attorney. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> what piece of advice would you give the lawyers? that are mapping out their journey and the ones who aspire to one day be a judge, give them a piece of advice that you would not learn in, in the uh, law books. Hmm. Well, you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, I, as I said, I, I, I don't know that I really had a journey uh, mm. to, to any of the things that I did. It was, you know, things just sort of happened. I think it's one of the beauties of having a law degree is that it sort of opens you up to a variety of, of experiences and opportunities. And so I, I'd say don't be closed-minded. If something mm. comes along, you know, kind of be open to it. You never know where it might lead you. And because you have that sort of background experience of, of, uh, of you know, viewing things from that legal perspective, it does lend itself to lots of other kinds of, of adventures as well. But the important thing, I think, for anyone is that you go, when you're going into it, you have a, you know, commitment to justice that you, um, that's what really matters, I think, in terms of what happens mm -hmm. with the rest of your career. If you don't, if you're just here to say, I'm going to go and do this and make Boku's money, I suppose you could do that, and that would be fine if you're happy with that. But I would like to think that people who are going into this profession, because it has such an impact on, on society, on the world, that you basically have a commitment you know, to justice, a commitment to the law itself, a commitment to the Constitution, which, well, I'll leave that alone. Okay. But a commitment to All the right. Constitution, <laughs> because that's the, that's the thing that we're, <laughs> that's what we're, you know, adhering to. And if, you, and if you're committed to that and, and, um, and, and, and that's your basis for wherever you're going, then you can, if you choose to do, if you choose to pursue going on the bench uh, and, you know, whatever the, whatever the requirements are for that at this point, if that's what you want to do, then fine. I think you'll be prepared to do that. But above all, I just say, you know, have a commitment to the, commitment to the law, have a commitment to justice and, you know, take it from there. All yeah, don't right. just be... Yeah. That's Don't just be. Well, I'm excited to hear more. <laughs> and at this particular time, we're going to go for a quick break and we'll come back and continue our talk with uh, S Judge Sandra Sims. Retired. Stay tuned. Retired. Retired, Retired Judge Sandra <laughs> Sims. All yeah. right. I'm going to the game and it's going to be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink, but won't be drinking today because I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line, keeps him from drinking too much so he can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way because it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you want to be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that said, let's go.
Welcome back to Sister Power. My name is Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, and I'm your host. And for the viewers who are just tuning in, we have our first guest here at Sister Power, Hawaii's. Let's get it right. Hawaii's <laughs> first African American woman judge, retired Judge Sandra Sims. Welcome back. Thank we were, you. We Thank were you. Just discussing uh, the um, experiences, and you were talking about your passion about being an attorney. And a quick question I would like to ask you to go back to, before we touch on your, your book, Tales from the Bench, is it hard for younger lawyers to gain experience in the courtroom? Well, in the courtroom, yes. Uh, because if you're going into private practice, for lawyers just coming out of law school, if you're going into private practice and stuff, or you know, even starting your own, it's gonna be uh, really, really difficult to get courtroom experience. Now, you mm. can, you know, certainly work in a firm and do things, but still, it's still the best place to get that kind of courtroom experience, actually being in the court on a daily basis, is with, with government, working with either prosecutors or uh, with the public defender's office, and uh, that's where you really get the experience of being in the courtroom. Now, having said that, I want to correct a, okay. a, a misconception that a lot of people have about uh, pros, you know, public lawyers, public defenders, particularly, and 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 young lawyers coming up. Usually, it's now that's now becoming a career path uh, for a lot of lawyers that are coming out of law school. This is what they want to do. It used to be perceived that just simply entry level, you're going to go there and then go off and make big bucks. But now there are many, many, many young lawyers with a commitment to doing things like public interest and commitment to doing things like public service. And so they stay in those professions. Mm. And what ends up happening is that, and particularly on the felony level, the most experienced attorneys are in the public defender's office, oh. are in the prosecutor's office, those that are doing felony, serious felony cases, because they're in court all the time, every day. They know everybody and everything but, and what to do in those situations. And so, uh, if for those of you who think, oh, I want to, we often would hear people say, oh, I, they didn't have a, they had a public tender, they didn't want to go get a, quote, real mm. lawyer, whatever that means. And so, see, but you know, you've got this person here who has, who has tried hundreds of cases, hundreds of serious felony cases, and they've put a lot of time in, they know what they're doing. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's probably going to get tougher to get that experience because more of those folks are staying in those offices mm -hmm. and really going in. And they, they, they do a really good job. They really and, do. And I'm glad you clarified that because I yeah. think public defenders get a bad rap. They really do and, get a bad rap. They get a bad they rap. Really do. And they, they are the most experienced attorneys. Uh, so now, I mean, obviously, you know, you're going to run into some people that may not be. But for the most part, particularly in, and I, and I can I speak for Hawaii because I can say that. Sure. I've seen it. And this is some of the best of best lawyers. I mean, there's some good lawyers. There's some. I, I got some good friends who are very good lawyers. Yes, I, don't yeah, we? Of course, I do. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not gonna. I don't want to take away from mm -hmm. um, um, the quality of the work that they're doing in these offices. And so, for people to feel like if I want to get that courtroom experience, that's still the place to go. Oh, good. All right. Well, if you can get there. If you can get there. <laughs> All right. Well, let's yeah. switch gears a, a okay. bit and talk about your book, Tales <laughs> from the Bench. Tales from the Bench. This is a, a retired Judge Sandra Sims' book. What influenced your decision to write essays on life and justice? <sighs> There's a number of things okay. that influenced that decision. One of them was one of one of them was a person, uh, Ian Adams, who's on Maui. Yes, I know Ian. Is on on on, um, on um, Maui. She and uh, Dr. Catherine Takara had a company, uh, Pacific Raven Press. They actually published a book. Hmm. And one of the things that um, uh, after I left the bench, and she talked to me a lot about this, was the idea that as African Americans, as black Americans, and it's particularly why that we, as she put it, tell our own stories. And, you know, and she really talked a lot to me about the fact that, you know, I had been in this position. Uh, I did have something to say from that perspective of having, you know, been on the bench. That's not something that is, was a common experience, I guess, for black sure. women. And I mean, she basically just harangued me. Okay. 
Okay. <laughs> so, get this. so you've got to tell our story. Don't let mm. someone else. She says, 100 years from now, they're going to want to know, when someone wants to know what happened in uh, 2004 when we had a black female judge, what happened, what did they do, and they'll, you, there'll be some person go, oh, yeah, that was... She said, "No, we need to tell that story." Mm -hmm. And so, that was one. Of, that was one of the real impetus. The part of it was also a desire to kind of do um, a bit of a memoir to a certain extent. Talk sure. about my own. Although I didn't think that story of mine, personal story, was all that important, but she felt that it was. My family certainly felt that it was. And so, it sort of began as a twofold thing, mm -hmm. uh, kind of looking at my life story. And I'm not a person that's real good on talking about my own personal life. But then the other thing was to talk about this perspective from the bench. So one of the things that had happened was um, I, I was a very detailed note taker when I was on, on the bench. I wrote pretty much as a transcript. My notes really reveal everything. And my secretary at that time, my, uh, Sharon Cotto, her name's Sharon, too. I have okay. a lot of Sharons in my life. Um, she kept everything I had. She kept every, oh, so every file I ever, everything I ever wrote, she kept it. So I had all this material that she, you know, when we left, I, she gave it up by boxes of all these case notes and stuff. So I think you, once you start looking at the notes, you can sort of remember the incident. And so I decided to kind of look at those things and, 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 and write, not from the perspective of being a legal treatise, but basically to kind of tell that story for that particular case, whatever mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. or whatever the issue was, instead of it being, you know, the, the legal issue here was whether or not there was enough evidence. It was like, what is the story behind this case? Who is this person here that wound up in this particular situation that they're in front of the justice, you know, they're in front of court and having, and, and to look at that human side of it. So it wasn't really written so much just for, you know, the lawyers to examine all the legal issues, but for people to understand what it, who, who's in court and what's taking place in court. But it's your story. It's your story. Yeah, it's, yeah it, it, I it's, like that. Yeah, so that was kind of, so it was like yeah. tales. So the tales piece is like tales from the bench. It's like, you know, it's a story. Well, I, you know, I, I like <laughs> that. I like a lot of your subject matters here. And you were talking about jury duty, and you have a chapter here, how to get out of jury duty. And I'm sure our listeners want to hear about that. <laughs> well, actually, the title is deceiving. Okay, <laughs> it is. All right. How to get well, out of jury clear duty? Clear the facts. How to get out of jury duty? And the answer is not. Okay. Uh, there, there, you shouldn't try to get. I, mm -mm. I don't want anybody trying mm -hmm. to get out. Everybody should try to be on jury duty. All right. It's one of the most important things that we can do as a society is be a part of a jury. That's why I'm dying to go down for when they do my summons, and I don't hope I probably won't get picked, but whatever. But it is the, it is probably the most important thing, particularly for minorities. African Americans, don't don't be on the jury. Okay. Dang it. Get on. If you can be on the jury, do it. It is the way that we assure that justice works. Um, there's so many cases in our history, you know, about you know biased juries and all white juries doing this and mm -hmm. all. You know, and and while I don't want to necessarily get all caught up in just the color of what people's of of the jurors, the point of it being is that when and I say this in the book re real quick. When you have a jury panel composed of, of young people, older people, um, minority people, Caucasians, everybody, when you have that mix of people and each of them coming together to bring their own life experience, it's, I'm not saying this, a, it's a, but their life experience to looking at a set of facts mm -hmm. that are presented in the form of a case and having to apply the law to those facts. And they can come to the same conclusion of either the person is guilty or not guilty, or we can't even agree because we can't see that they've met that burden of proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I tell my students, it's, that's just like perfection. And so, it is real important that to make certain that our justice system works, that people participate in juries. I always tell, I would tell the jurors, says in that moment when you are making, when people complain about, oh, our justice system is biased, mm -hmm. our justice is, is got pro it, it has got problems, and there are things that we can we can do to make changes. There's a lot we can do, but in that moment that you are a juror, 
and you are listening to that evidence and you are applying the law to that case and that person is sitting in front of you come out and say we have a verdict and you've done it correctly when that happens in that moment you are the justice system you are it you are justice that's it when the juror when a, when a when a when a diverse jury announces its verdict and has fairly and and thoughtfully considered all the evidence that that instant that's justice all right and we only have a short time we must do yeah. part two <laughs> but tell me very quickly life after the bench i'm having a ball you having a ball <laughs> that's what we want to hear you having I, a grand I, time I, I, well I, I am uh, teaching at uh Chaminade in the criminal justice program and i like being a part of that because it's like working with you know real young minds they're not all trying to be lawyers they want to be police officers mm -hmm. they want to be probation officers. they want to be forensics and so i'm telling them too yeah this is really important you guys so we have we have fun i have fun doing that i uh volunteer i just in fact I just came from the museum of art that's one of my fun things oh yeah we serve on know, the african-american <laughs> film festival it's, together uh, you know, being a, a docent at the museum and working yeah. with the film festival yeah and i'm on a couple of boards you know mental health america and uh the state council on mental health and that's two of the boards that i'm working been working with for some time and doing a lot of work with addressing some of the issues pertaining to you know mental mental health and uh, mental health awareness and um, and a lot of it, unfortunately, dealing with homelessness and, and addiction as well. But it's uh, it's 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 good work. It's fun. Well, not fun, but it's it's I it's very fulfilling. I, I I'm, I'm involved sure it's in empowering. that. Mm -hmm. And uh, just I do some traveling. <laughs> <laughs> I get I get teased about it, but I I do quite a bit of traveling. <laughs> Well, I tell you, the next week. <laughs> this has been a lot of fun for me. Never School fun. is never out. We want you back. Again, my name is Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, the host for Sister Power. And thank you to Hawaii's first African American woman judge. Retired. Retired <laughs> Judge Sandra Sims. Again, thank you. And please join us again for part two with retired Judge Sandra Sims. Thank, thank you, you very thanks much. For thanks for having me on your show. Oh, this, this was wonderful. Fun.